Hilchis Shabbos, Perek Shvi'i, the laws of Shabbos, chapter 7. Today is an exciting chapter. We've talked so much around the Melachot, around the forbidden labors of Shabbat. We've talked about preparations for Shabbat on Friday. We've talked about Hadlakat Neirot. We've talked about when it is and it isn't permitted to tell a Goy, a Gentile, to do work for us. Now let's get to the actual work. What are the works, the labors, the acts that are forbidden on Shabbat? Of course, famously, the Torah says in the Ten Commandments, the Yom HaShvi'i Shabbat LaShem Alokecha Lo Ta'aseh Kol Malacha. You may not do any labor. How do we define what labor is? So the Talmud tells us we take a look at the Mishkan, the sanctuary which was built in the desert for Hashem. Whatever was considered an important act of labor, a constructive act of labor in the process of making the tabernacle, is considered to be a labor which is forbidden on the Shabbos. How many do we have? 39. Famously known, Lametet Malachot, the 39 forbidden labors on the Shabbos. Matter of fact, that Jerusalem Talmud finds a hint for this in the beginning of the portion of Vayakhil, when Moshe Rabbeinu commanded the Jews about building the actual tabernacle, he introduced it by telling them the laws of Shabbat. He said, Eile hadvarim. These are the things that Hashem commanded us to do. The word Eile in Hebrew has the numerical value of 36. Aleph is 1, Lamed is 30, He is 5, 36, plus the three letters of the word Eile equals 39. There we have a reference to the fact that there's going to be 39 forbidden acts of labor on Shabbos, mirrored by the fact that they are the 39 labors that it takes to construct the Mishkan. And the Rambam will list them today in chapter 7. And then from chapter 8 and onwards, the Rambam is going to go milacha by milacha, labor by labor, and define exactly the parameters, the minimum amount to become liable for each one, what else is included under the roof of specific milachot. And this is going to be going forward our... Uh, our trajectory, and Bezat Hashem, it should be for much success. Let's begin, Halacha Aleph. Melachot, the labors shechayavin alehen skila vekaret b'mezid, for which we are liable, stoning or excision on purpose, or karban chatat bishgaga, or to bring a sin offering if we did them inadvertently. Remember in chapter 1, the Ramam said, every time you do a forbidden labor, sometimes you'll be chayav, sometimes you'll be obligated, liable, and liable could be split into two categories. If you did it on purpose, the neshama is cut off, with witnesses and warning, then the human being is also stoned to death. And if it's only inadvertent, then it's bish gaga, and therefore you bring only a karban chatat, a sin offering. So which malachot qualify to make you liable for these things? Mehen avod, says the Rambam, or mehen taladot. Some of them are called fathers, and some of them are called offspring, children. There are primary labors and derivatives, secondary labors. We're going to soon see what makes them secondary and primary. It's not a level of severity. They're both equally severe. But some of them are called fathers, some of them are called offspring. The number of all the melachot that are called fathers, the primary labors, are 40 minus 1. The Raman borrows this expression from the Mishnah. There's some discussion as to why they use this expression. Why not just say 39 straight out? Why 40 minus 1? But that's what it is. 40 minus 1, 39 melachot. And we're going to go through each and every one of them now in short and then develop them further in the coming chapters. Ve'eluhein, they are the following. Number 1, hacharisha, plowing. Simply the act of plowing, overturning the earth in the field before you plant it. Number two, v'hazria, planting, sowing the actual seeds so something can grow. V'hakitsira, number three, harvesting, reaping. Once the, once the plants grow, you want to cut it for yourself. Number four, v'ha'imur, and gathering. Once you've cut the wheat, you now need to gather it in and make it into bundles. Of course, we're talking about everything in terms of wheat and grain and produce, but we're going to see it applies to many other things as well. Number five, v'hadisha, and threshing. That's when the cow would walk over the wheat stalks to start the separation of the chaff and the kernel inside it. Number six, vahazria, winnowing. This is called in, when you throw, once you've threshed, now you throw it up to the wind, and the wind itself will, will separate, will allow for the separation of the kernel, which is heavier, and the chaff to blow out in the wind. Number seven, vahabrira, and sorting. Once you've cut out the kernels, there's still some negative pieces left that you don't want to eat, so you have to sort through them and separate them. That's a primary melacha on the Shabbat. Number eight, v'hatchina, and grinding. Once you have the kernels, now you've got to grind them into flour. Number nine, v'haharkada, and sifting. Once you grind the flour, you've got to sift it to make sure you're getting the purest of the pure. V'halisha, number 10, is kneading. You need a dough. V'ha'afiyah, number 11, is baking. Cooking is also under this umbrella, but here you see what's called in the Talmud, sidura de pat. The first 11 melachot are the order of creating bread. You plow, you plant, you reap, you gather, you thresh, you winnow, you sort, you grind, you sift, you knead, and you bake. 
The next section of the Melechot is involved in uh, making clothing. So we begin with number 12, the Hagziza, shearing. You shear wool from an animal. Here we use the sheep. You shear the wool. And now what the next thing you do is number 13, the Halibun. You whitewash it. You launder it. You put it in water so that the dirt begins to separate from the wool. The Haniputz is the next one. Typically, this is translated as combing. According to many authorities, Niputz is combing. According to the Rambam, we're going to see later, Niputz actually means beating. You would beat the wool or the flax that you had cut before you begin to shape it into fabric. The Hatsvi'a, the next step is to dye. You dye your wool or your material with the given color that you'd like, to, like it to be turned into. The Hatsvi'a, then you spin it into thread. And then we approach the actual making of the cloth. Typically, clothing was made by weaving, and so many of the melachot coming up now involve weaving. Just before we get into the details, I want to show you a little bit of a primitive picture, because this will help us to understand how the loom, the weaving loom, used to work. The idea of weaving is that you have strands going this way, that's called the warp, and then you have strands going the other way, that's called the woof, and by tightening them, you create the cloth. Now, in order for this loom to function, it would be way, way too tedious for somebody to line up all the warp strings and then go manually up and down, up and down, up and down with the woof strings to make the weave. So what you do is you create what's called heddles. These are little frames and in the frames there are holes. Holes for each of the warp threads. But the way you do it is you make two heddles, two frames of heddles, one behind the other at alternate distances such that string number one goes through the heddle in this one and string number two goes through the heddle in that one three in this one, four in that one, etc. When the person is ready to begin to weave by means of pedals at the feet, which you can see here in this picture, that would allow the weaver to lift up one frame and then lift up the other frame alternately. When one frame is lifted, what you essentially have is every second warp thread is up and there's now space to pass the woof directly through. And once it comes down, you will now see the woof going this way as it should in the weave. When the next pedal is pressed and the other frame comes up, now the woof is passed through the other way and the same goal is achieved. That's how weaving is done through this process. So the Ramam is going to say that there's a number of melachot, a number of primary acts of labor that are associated with creating this act of weaving. We begin with va'asiyat hanirin. According to the Rambam, asiyat hanirin is the making of the heddles. Here you can see, because the other picture was you know, very widened to show the space, but when you actually weave, there's many, 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 many heddles. Every time you make one of those holes, Every time you make, that's a near. Near is one of the holes, the heddle. Every time you form a hole for, the, for a warp string to go through, that's a melacha. That's the asiyat hanirin, the making of the heddles. Next is vahansachat hamasecha, mounting the warp, putting those strings that are going across, called in Hebrew chutei shti or chutei orech. The strings that go lengthwise, let me just bring you back to the primitive picture so you can see clearly. These strings, when you mount them over the two edges of the loom, you have to mount them tightly to put them in place, and then the Ramam will describe to us later, there's a couple of steps to this process where you kind of beat them down to flatten them, etc. But when you're putting those strings across and through the heddles, that's called hansachat hamasecha. That is another primary act of labor. And then you have the actual veha ariga, the actual weeping. That's when you have all the warp threads are set up and you're taking the woof and passing it through easily because the frame with the heddles has lifted it up and made it easy to maneuver, but that's the act of ariga. The act of ariga is passing the woof through the warp. The habitsia is another melacha associated with weaving, is when you have to undo the weave. Sometimes it's necessary, something rips, something snaps, you have to undo it and come back to it. The undoing itself is also an important labor and is considered to be one of the 39 melachot. Then, the hakshira, let's say you take the material that you have, sometimes you end up wanting to tie it. Some say you would tie it at the end of a weave, so it's actually part of the making of the garments. You would tie the loose ends. That's one of the melachot. The hahatara, untying a strong knot, is also considered to be one of the 39 melachot. Then, the hatfira, we have sewing. Of course, if you sew stitches onto a garment, that's also a melacha. The hakriya, and tearing. The original context of tearing is the opposite of sewing. You would tear open some of the stitches to make room for a proper restitching. But also included in the melacha is actual tearing of paper or tearing of fabric, as we'll soon discuss in the later chapters, Bezrat Hashem. Then we have two malachot that kind of stand alone. The habinyan, building, constructing anything, is called one of the three malachot. The hastira and demolishing as well is also a malacha. The haka'a patish. This is literally translated as banging with a hammer. Because apparently, as Raman will define in later chapters, the final stage in completing a vessel, a utensil that's being formed out of metal, is to give it a couple of 
wax with a special hammer that would kind of hold everything into place. Or also at the end of engraving a design into a, into a utensil, there'd be like a final touch. That's called Haka'a Bepatish. It's a general name for the final touch to a utensil that's being formed and fashioned out of metals. And of course, there are many derivatives and things that go under that umbrella. Now we move on to the process of making parchment. Of course, they didn't have so much paper accessible in those days. It was usually using hides of animals to make things to write on. So we go through the entire process of that. And we begin with vahatsida, trapping. The first thing was required is to trap an animal so you can use its hide. That's a deer stuck in a cage. Vahashchita, then you need to slaughter the animal or the bird that you've trapped. Vahahafshata, what comes next is the skinning process. You have to skin the animals to get the hide. Vahahavada, and the tanning process. The tanning process is where you work the hides, you process them, and they're soaking it in different liquids, etc. That would be an element of creating the parchment. Umichikat haor. The next thing you have to do is to cut off all the hair that's left on the hide so it becomes completely flat and ready for writing. The chitucho, then you have to cut it to size so you make sure you have your desired um, shape or form or uh, length or width of the parchment that you need. And then finally, we can come to Bahaktiva, the actual writing on the parchment, Bahamichika, like we saw in many of the malachot, the flip side is also considered to be a malacha. Erasing written words is also considered one of the third malachot. Bahasirtut making lines. We've talked about this in the laws of Tefillin and Mezuzah and Sefer Torah, how every proper Torah scroll that's written has to have ruled lines on it. And apparently this was a custom that was done in all kinds of writing. So if you rule lines on a piece of paper or on a piece of parchment, that's one of the 39 melachot. Ve'hahav ara, lighting a fire. Ve'hakibui, and extinguishing a fire are also some of the 39 melachot. And the final one, the 39th, is ve'hahot sa'am, irshut lirshut, carrying from one domain to another. Typically, this is defined as carrying from a private domain to a public domain or from a public domain to a private domain. Also, part of this malacha is transferring something within a public domain a certain distance, and it is this malacha that becomes a major focal point of many of the chapters in these halachot. Disproportionately, the amount of chapters devoted to this malacha of carrying is way more than any of the other chapters, um, any other malachot even put together. But the bottom line is here we have the list of the 39 malachot Avot Melachot, 39 fathers, primary acts of labor that are forbidden on the Shabbos. Halacha Bet says that Rambam kol elu ha-melachot, all of these acts of labor, v'chol shehu me'in yanam, and anything which is on their topic, which resembles them, hem ha-nikra'in avot melachot, are all called fathers of melacha. So the 39 names that I gave you just now, and also anything which is directly resembling these melachot. What does that mean, directly resembling the melachot? Ketzad hu inyanam. What would qualify as being on the same topic as one of the 39 melachot? So the Rambam takes the first one, for example, plowing. Echad ha-choresh, whether somebody who actively plows with a plow, o ha or somebody who digs manually into the ground, o ha or somebody who makes a furrow, digging a hole or, a, or, or an irrigation line into the ground. Hareza av melacha, all of these are considered to be the primary, the father act of labor. Even though we, when we gave it the name, the name that we gave it was harisha, just plowing. But since digging a ditch or digging a furrow directly relates to the idea of plowing, overturning earth, softening it for planting, it's all considered um, shak- all considered av melacha, shakol achat v'achat me'en chafira v'karka, because each one is digging in the ground, v'inyan achadu, and it's one topic. Halacha gimel, another example of the related topic. V'chein azorea zra'im, o hanotea ilanot, planting plants and planting a tree, or extending a tree. Sometimes they would do this. You had a growing tree, took one of the branches, put it back into the ground, and it came up growing another, another, another um, version of the tree. Or markiv is grafting. You take another type of branch from another tree, you put it into this tree, and it actually grows from the roots of this tree. Or you prune. They all go into this one category, and they're not children. They're not toladot. They're actually all part of the av. They're all part of the father primary work. Because it's one topic. Each one of them is followed by or is accompanied with the intent of making something grow. You're growing a plant, you're growing a tree. Even when you prune, you're growing the tree better. You're taking away the extra shoots. And certainly when you graft or extend, it's the same thing. I remember the principle we had earlier in these chapters, Malechet Machashevet Asrat Torah. Torah forbids integral, as integral to the, to the labor as the deed, so too is integral the thought and the intent that goes into it. So since the intent over here is all the same, it all goes into the category of the Av. It's interesting that some of these things, when it comes to Shemitah, 
but we also have the obligation to rest from work. Over there, they're called toladot, they're called children, they're not the av. And that's because of this difference. When it comes to Shabbat, the whole idea of the melecha has to be melechet machashevet. Not so when it comes to Shemitah. So when it comes to Shemitah, since it's not the exact act of planting, they wouldn't be considered to be the av. They're considered to be a, der- a derivative, a tulda. But over here, they're all part of the av. Halacha dalet, another example of inyan echad, same topic. V'chein kotzer tvu'ah o kitnit. When you reap, we gave the example of reaping grain. But it's true if you reap legumes, beans, and stuff like that. Or whether you harvest grapes, or you harvest dates, or you harvest olives, or you harvest figs. They're all one father of work. Because in all these cases, what you want to do, your intention is to uproot something from its growth source. And the same principle can be applied to all of the other avot, all the other fathers. So if the same topic is considered to be part of the av, what's a tolda? What's a derivative? Says the Rambam, Hatolada, he hamalacha hadoma la av me elo haavot. A tolada, an offspring, a derivative, is a type of work which is only similar. It doesn't exactly resemble and in the same topic. It's only similar to one of the fathers. Ketzad, for example, what do we mean? Hamechatechat hayarak ma'at lavashlo. Let's say you slice, you dice a vegetable super, super thin in order to cook it. It resembles grinding. You'd be obligated, you'd be liable for desecrating Shabbos. Because this work is an offspring of grinding. What's the point? When you grind flour, what are you doing? You're taking one substance, one kernel, splitting it up into many, many pieces. So whenever you do something similar to that, yeah, you're not putting it under a grinder, yeah, it's not produce, it's not turning it into flour, but you're taking a vegetable and boom, 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 you're slicing it very, very thin. It's a derivative of tochen, of grinding. Somebody who takes a block of metal, and he rubs it down to take some of the dust, the metal dust, as sometimes goldsmiths do to fill in certain nooks and crannies in their, in their patterns of, uh, of designing gold. They do this even until even today. They call it granulation, other types of things where you take other metals and kind of insert it into designs of gold. Same thing. It's a tulda, it's a derivative of the grinding. It's pretty hard to define the exact difference between inyan echad and tulda. Like, how do you say, how come this one is only considered to be resembling and that was considered on the same topic? Some commentaries say when it comes to a tulda, both the intent is different and the way you do it is different. You don't grind flour the same way you crush metal. And it's also a different intent. You're trying to get something into, into very small bits, but one is for cooking, one is for making a design. That's more of a tolda. When it's directly related to growing something from the ground, all different acts related to planting and making things grow go under one av. But this has been the subject of major, major commentaries. People have written books to define exactly the difference between inyan and tolda. And we're just going to leave it with what the Ramam gives us. Halacha vav, another example of a tolda. Person who takes milk and puts in it a piece of the intestines, which have enzymes, in order to curdle the milk and turn it into cheese or butter. You are obligated, you're liable on account of it being a derivative of the malacha of sorting. When you put the enzyme in, you cause you cause the curds and the whey to separate. If you then took this curdled milk and made it into actual cheese, now you're building. Because anybody who takes piece by piece, sticks it together and makes it into one body, that's similar to building. You're not building a house, you build cheese. The Rebbe learns from here, very interesting. You see, the Ramam uses like a double expression. You bring piece to piece and then you stick it together until they become one body. Sometimes you can bring people together, they're piece by piece. You bring them together, but they're just there. They're just together. They're not actually believing that they're one entity. The ultimate idea of building, building a house for Hashem, Building this world into a holy place is when we can convince and when we can harmonize the, dif- the differing elements in the world, differing people, differing opinions, and make them understand how each one contributes to a greater whole. They become guf echad. But anyway, in the level of the legalities of things, it's similar to building. And the same applies to every one of the 39 labors of the fathers. They all have children, offspring, derivatives in the way that we described it. And by examining the body of the melacha, which is done on Shabbos, teda, you can know, whether it's a resembling topic of one of the fathers or it's an offspring of one of the fathers, you examine what it is that's motivating the work and you figure out which category it goes into. Halacha Zayin says the Rambam, 
it, you can get the impression that fathers and derivatives are on different levels of severity. It's not true, says the Rambam. Whether you do one of the fathers or you do one of the derivatives, if you do it on purpose, you're equally chayav karet, you're equally liable to excision. Vim ba'oedim niskal. Witnesses see you and come testify against you, you get stoned. B'shogeg chayav chatat kvua. You do it inadvertently, you're obligated to bring a sin offering. In kein if so, ma hefresh yesh ben ha'avot v'hatoldot. It's meaningless. Why, why ascribe a difference? Why call one thing a father, one thing an offspring, if the level of liability is exactly the same? It says the Rambam, you're right. Ein b'nei hefresh. There is no difference. Ela li'inyana korban bilvat. The only time there can possibly be a difference is when it comes to bringing a sacrifice. You see, you bring a sacrifice, a sin offering, for doing a melacha inadvertently. The thing with inadvertence is that you can be in a state of not knowing through the process of many acts. You can do many things wrong because you don't know that any of them are forbidden. So what happens if you do multiple melachot on Shabbat in a state of unawareness? It says the Ramam, here's where the difference will come between fathers and derivatives. Sheha Oseb b'shogeg. When a person does melacha by mistake, inadvertent, unaware. Im asa avot harbe behelem echad. If he does many fathers, many primary labors, in one state of unawareness, chayav chatat achat al kol av va'av. You're obligated to bring a separate sin offering for every father that you violated. But were you to do a father and its offsprings in one state of unawareness, over here you're only going to be obligated to bring one sin offering. The Ramam doesn't mention it over here, but the commentaries explain that the same would hold true if you did multiple derivatives. If you did multiple taladot, you're obligated for each one on its own. Certainly if you did taladot of multiple avot. But because one is called an av and one is called a tolada, if you were to do an av and its toladot, now you're obligated only to bring one sin offering, and that's where the difference comes out between defining one as a father and one as a derivative. Halacha chet keta. Let's describe. What, what does this look like? In one state of unawareness, you plowed, you planted, and you reaped. You didn't know that either of them were forbidden on Shabbos. You did all three. Chayav shalosh chatot. You're obligated to bring three different sin offerings, one for each av melacha that you violated. Even if you did all 39 in one Shabbos, in one state of unawareness, inadvertently, for example, you forgot that all of these melachot are forbidden to do on Shabbos. You'd be obligated for every labor to bring an individual chatat. Why does the Rambam describe that the inadvertence is that you forgot that these melachot are forbidden? Because there's another way to be inadvertent. The other way to be inadvertent is to actually know that these are all forbidden acts, but just forget that it's Shabbos. If you forgot that it's Shabbos, then you only have one issue, not 39. See, if you know it's Shabbos and you forgot about the, the labors, you have 39 issues, because you did 39 bad things in a state of unawareness. But if you knew that the, all, all things were forbidden, and you just forgot that it's Shabbos, you only have one issue, you only bring one chatat in that case. But in this case, the Rambam describes that you forgot that all the work is forbidden, but you knew it was Shabbos, then you're obligated to bring a separate chatat for each one. That would, that would be the example of doing separate avot and being obligated individual chatat. But were you to grind some flour and cut some vegetables very thin and, and saw down or rub down a block of metal in one state of unawareness, that's the av, and it's toladot, now you're only going to be obligated to bring one sin offering. Because all you committed was one father, one primary laborer, and his derivatives. And the same would apply in all similar situations. We didn't give an example for doing many resembling melachot. What if you do many of the primary labors that go into one category in one shot of unawareness? That's considered only having committed one primary labor and you only bring one chatat to cover all of them. Keita, what did that look like? You did all five things that go into the primary category of planting. You planted plants, you planted trees, you extended a tree, like you have here, you grafted a tree and you pruned a tree, all in one state of unawareness. You only have to bring one sin offering. Because they're all one father. They're all one primary category of work. And the same applies to anything similar. So multiple avot, multiple chataot. Multiple acts within one av, only one chatat. Av and its toladot, also only bring one chatat, multiple toladot, multiple chataot. And with that, we conclude the major list, the primary list of the primary labors on Shabbos. Starting tomorrow, we're going to go into the details, each malachah individually getting much more information and expanding upon each of the 39 malachot.